Hello, BYU students. Faculty, staff, friends, family. Or really, we Southerners were more comfortable just saying, hi, y'all. <laughs> now, before we launch into this devotional, I have a little experience to share that I had on May 1st, 2014, with your wonderful and, at the time, brand new BYU president, even President Worthen. I and about a thousand Relief Society sisters and Sister Worthen and President Worthen were standing at long tables in the field house. For our humanitarian aid, we were filling food boxes, and we had on hairnets, nice yellow ones. President and Sister Worthen had on their hairnets, too. I ended up standing next to the President for a while. His work was to hold open a plastic bag and I was to pour beans and lentils into the bag, and we were doing pretty well. But then either one bag didn't get opened big enough, or I got distracted and missed the bag because suddenly President Worthen had lentils falling all over his shoes. There he stood with little beans on his feet and a hairnet on his head, and he looked at me with a somewhat mournful smile and said, well, this is my first day on the job. <laughs> President Worthen, you've come a long way. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I hope when we walk out of this devotional, the Spirit will have assured us of two certainties. One, that we will know when we focus on Jesus Christ faithfully and intently, we draw His strength into our souls. And two, when we act on this spiritual strength and do things His way, we will understand more deeply that there is no other name or way whereby salvation can come to us, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. So how do we focus consistently on Him and act on His strength? We choose throughout the day to be open to the Spirit and act on those promptings. We covenant weekly to always remember Him. President Nelson states, nothing invites the Spirit more than fixing your focus on Jesus Christ. When I was a little girl during the hot, muggy Louisiana summers, my father would promise us kids that if we were ready and waiting when he got home from work, he would take us swimming at the city park pool. At 5 p.m. on most afternoons, I and two of my younger brothers lined up on the hot cement curb in front of our house in our swimming suits, towels around our necks, peering seriously down the street at the corner. Even the hot pavement couldn't break our concentration. Though sometimes we would jump back to the cool grass of the yard for a moment, we would not shift our gaze from the far corner of the street. Here you see three of my grandchildren enacting this event, Fielding, Gemma, and Matthias Marriott. When Daddy's green Ford rounded the corner, we cheered, jumping up and down. He would get out of the car, pulling his tie off and saying, I'll be right back. Soon he returned in his swimming suit, and we were on our way to the pool. Now, why did we three young kids stay so sharply focused? Why were we so certain we would get to go swimming? Because we knew our Father. Because we knew He loved us and had felt His love. Because He kept His promises, and so we trusted Him. And we knew He had power we didn't have, because He could drive a car and get us to the pool. So we focused on Him, our unfailing driver, to get us where we wanted to go. Do we truly know the Lord? feel His love, and trust His almighty capacity to take us to a place of healing, love, and progress? If so, do we look to Him steadily? Where is your focus in daily life and when you are facing challenges? President Nelson said, My brothers and sisters, I plead with you to make time for the Lord. What is the ratio of time we spend between making time for the Lord and making time for the world? When we want answers, do we first look to the trending opinions of others? Do we first search the internet hoping we'll find the way to have confidence in social situations or tips on getting along with our roommate or even ways to be healed from the deepest wounds in our hearts? 
or is the Lord far from the thoughts and intents of our hearts? If we only depend on the world and its answers, we're going to be disappointed sooner or later. Spiritual wisdom, real peace, healing, and godly discernment come to us from Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost, not from opinions of the world. We choose the direction of our thoughts and actions. We choose where we turn for help. It takes mental effort to look to Christ when other places offer quicker answers. The more we look to Him, remember Him, and learn of Him in the scriptures, the more we will trust Him and go in His name to Heavenly Father for direction. I had a delightful conversation with an Olympic champion recently. She is Noelle Picus Pace, winner of the silver medal in the skeleton race in the 2014 Olympics in Sochi, Russia. I asked Sister Pace and her husband Jansen Pace about the skeleton and how in the world she steered it since she was flat on her stomach with her hands at her sides as she moved along the ice at about 90 miles an hour. Let's hear what she had to say. Noelle, thank you. It's a privilege to be here in your beautiful home with you and Jansen. I am so honored that you would spend time with me. I um, don't know a thing about the skeleton <laughs> racing or sledding or however you call it, but would you just talk to us about what it is, how you, how you race, how you train, how you steer, how you flop down on your tummy on that sled and scoot down the, the track? and. And what part Jansen's played? So skeleton is a crazy headfirst sport where an athlete runs and jumps headfirst onto their stomach on a tiny little cookie sheet. <laughs> <laughs> and we fly down the side of a mountain going 90 miles an hour. And we steer using our shoulders and our knees, applying pressure, just light pressure to guide the sled the entire way down a mile long course to, to hopefully, ultimately cross that finish line. Oh. And the sled is only about three feet long. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, it's about three feet and it weighs about 65 pounds, so it's got some weight to it. And Jansen actually built and designed my sled for the 2010 and 2014 Olympic Games. So he actually knows a lot more about the content of the sled and then I enjoy driving it down the track. <laughs> Jansen, how, how, did, how did you know how to do this and how does she move one shoulder and get it to go? I mean, what does the sled do? Yeah, uh, I had a small background just in designing with SolidWorks, a 3D modeling program, and um, it was it seemed like a fun opportunity for me. Uh, more importantly, she really needed a sled to get down the track, <laughs> and I realized that in order for her to be able to focus and to get down the track where she needed to go, she needed some equipment that's going to help her do that, and she'd struggled for, for a while to try and find the right, the right equipment for that, and so I, I just... Crossed my fingers one day and uh, one summer, I guess I should say, and uh, went a to lot work. Of prayer, a lot of a lot went into that. Thousands of pages. Yeah. This is a long journey. You were injured in was it 2004? Yeah, 2005. At going into the so going into the 2006 Winter Olympic Games, I was hit by a bobsled. Um, and I remember realizing at that time when this Olympic dream was just taken in a split second that I had a choice to make. I could either look back and be upset and frustrated that I missed out on this grand opportunity or I could choose to move forward. And so at that time I, I, I decided to move forward with the help of a great team with support um, with my husband, my family, and, and so many wonderful people around me. Uh, we were able to come back and, and in order to do that, I had to set goals along the way. So how do you get to the finish line, to the goal, when you have no steering wheel, no, no, it doesn't seem any visible sign of, of uh, control. Yeah. So as a rookie, a lot of times uh, you make the mistake of thinking that it's these massive changes that you need to take in order to get yourself down the track. But as an elite athlete, you start to realize that it's the subtle changes and that something as simple as looking where you want to go will put you where you need to be. So where you look is where you go was a statement that I would tell myself for years leading up into that Olympic podium. Just look where you want to go and then make the subtle adjustments to get there. Well, thank you. Thank you for your wisdom, your courage, your determination to make it after having broken legs and all kinds of problems before. But I, I just have in my mind your statement that you go where you look. 
to me that it, there's great wisdom in that, and it applies to our life and to all our decisions and choices. So thank you for the great example you've been. It's been a joy to talk to you. Thanks so much. <laughs> so Sister Pace said, where you look is where you go. Remember, she also said that she made subtle changes in her effort to run the race. It's not usually a massive change we need to make to return to the Lord in His ways. Where do you want to end up? Ultimately, we want to go home to our glorious celestial home with our heavenly parents. And the Savior is the only way back to their presence. Our acceptance of His act of atonement is essential. Elder Tad Collister wrote, Though our life seems empty or pointless, there is a miraculous rebirth that emerges with our acceptance of the Savior and His atonement. Do we understand the absolute truth as stated in 1 Nephi 10, 6? All mankind were in a lost and fallen state and ever would be, save they should rely on this Redeemer. We need help, we need grace, and we will have it if we rely on Christ. Sometimes we must prove that we're serious about relying on Him when His grace seems slow in coming. Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf speaks of active waiting and staying with something and doing all we can even when the desires of our hearts are delayed. Brothers and sisters, when our 21-year-old daughter was critically injured in an accident, her father and I were serving a mission in Brazil. We hurriedly got a flight back to the United States. We trusted the Lord would answer our fervent prayers. She was given a priesthood blessing by a worthy priesthood holder, her brother, and we knew the Lord had the power to heal her. But Georgia died before our plane landed. We had prayed she would live. Did the Lord hear our prayers? Yes. Did He answer them as we pleaded? No. Then should we bitterly turn away from Him and look to some other source for peace and understanding? There is no other source of peace and eternal life than Jesus Christ. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed with our troubles, but the Lord is stronger than our challenges and gives us strength and inspiration to face them. I love Nephi's perspective when Laman and Lemuel complained, saying that Laban, keeper of the plates of brass, is a mighty man, and he can slay fifty, then why not us? Nephi declares, Let us be faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. For behold, he is mightier than Laban in his fifty, yea, than his tens of thousands. He is mightier than our fears, our disappointments, our weariness, and even the deep wounds of our heart. He is the great healer and God through our deep waters. He waits for us to come to him. It's true, we have to shoulder our burdens and do the hard work, but when we look with hope and love to Christ, we will be given compensating blessings that will bind us to Him in powerful ways, even if our challenge remains. Looking humbly and constantly to the Lord leads us to repentance, a change of heart and action. A year ago, our prophet said, I have thought about the need for each of us to remove, with the Savior's help, the old debris in our lives. Old debris! I have felt its weariness, whether it's troubling doubt about gospel truths, sin, resentment, fear, anger, confusion, pride, or other things. Do you have some of this old debris in your life? The Spirit can lead us to honestly recognize and remove our deep-seated baggage. In Jacob 4, verse 5, we read of the people's faith. They keep the law of Moses, it pointing our souls to Christ. What points your soul to Christ? Do you have a support system that turns you to God? These people of Jacob had witnesses which pointed their souls to Christ. In Hebrews 12, we read, Quote, seeing we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. I love that phrase, great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith. Our daughter-in-law, Marion Marriott, mother of seven, is a runner who, in fact, just ran the Salt Lake City Half Marathon in the rain and cold two weeks ago. When she ran, she had her support team of family, husband, brother, father, to cheer her on the way. And here she is with her husband, Daniel, crossing a finish line. Marion is being encompassed about by her cloud of witnesses, letting her know she could finish that race. We need to be each other's witnesses, witnessing that Jesus Christ, with him, with Jesus Christ, we too can finish our race. Did Marion run her race dragging along a full garbage can behind her? No, of course not. She ran the race setting aside all encumbrances that could hold her back and focusing solely on the finish line, no debris, and she made it. We too are running a race of life. We too have cloud, a cloud of witnesses to point our souls to the finish line and to our author and finisher, Jesus Christ. Perhaps we have a garbage can with debris that is slowing us down. We, let's actually do what President Nelson said and remove the old debris from our life. To me, that means repent, clean up our thoughts, our actions, our relationships. We have help all around us to help with this removal. When life is full of concerns, let's look to the witnesses of the Lord all around us. They could be likened to those certain pieces of equipment that Jansen and Noel Pace mentioned. Sister Pace needed her sled to get her to the finish line. For us, maybe our sled are other things. They are especially things like our scriptures, our temple covenants, the gift of the Holy Ghost, our prophets, our family, friends, ward leaders, all who point us to Christ. And with their witness, we are encouraged to turn to Him and begin the process of letting go of sins that so easily beset us. We may even have added new personal debris to that which is limiting us and our access to the Spirit. David and I have been remodeling part of our home, and I have become easily beset with temptations. I have to be on my guard. Because when I sit down to study scriptures each morning, if I'm not careful, a strange phenomenon occurs. I reach for the scriptures, and lo and behold, I find a home decor magazine in my hand. <laughs> if I stare at this magazine instead of moving it away, I suddenly realize that there is a lampshade or a rug for sale, and I'm sure I need these. And then I have to hop on the laptop to see if they're on sale and find it. And there I go, down a home decor rabbit hole, while the scriptures just wait. Now, those magazines aren't sinful, but they don't matter compared to eternal truths. They are powerless to bring us to spiritual guidance back to the Lord. In 2009, Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf gave a conference talk on what matters most. He spoke of a plane crash in which over 100 people were killed. After the accident, investigators tried to determine the cause. The landing gear had indeed lowered properly. The plane was in perfect mechanical condition. Everything was working properly, all except one thing, a single burned out light bulb. That tiny bulb, worth about 20 cents, started the chain of events that ultimately led to the tragic death of over 100 people. Of course, the malfunctioning light bulb didn't cause the accident. It happened because the crew placed its focus on something that seemed to matter at the moment, while losing sight of what mattered most. What do you want most? What matters most to you? Truly, Sister Pace is right. Where we look is where we go. So in our daily plans, actions, and conversation, let's look to the Savior, connecting to the source of our strength and happiness. Focusing on eternal things requires mental, emotional, and spiritual effort. President Nelson counseled us, quote, the Lord loves effort, and effort brings rewards." End quote. 
We really can't be casual if we're going to successfully obey and connect with the Lord. What does it mean to love God with all your might? Have you ever stretched to your absolute limit? Have you ever given everything in you to keep Him in your daily thoughts and attitudes? We were rafting on the Green River some years ago, and, I, and I, we had been told by our guide to stay in the boat or, if we decided to jump out, to stay close because if we got close to the rabbits, he couldn't get us. And if we were close to the rapids, we were to turn and put our feet out and push off the rocks as we went through them. I did not like the sound of pushing off the rocks or being bounced around in the rapids. But I was out having fun in the water and, was, and I was moving rather quickly ahead of the raft when I heard the loud sound of the rapids ahead. I turned back and yelled, pick me up! And the guide yelled back, swim toward us! Panicking, I began to swim with all my strength toward the boat, but the current was dragging me back faster than I was going forward toward the raft. With everything in me, I wanted to avoid going over those rocky rapids. I was stroking as hard as I could, training my eyes on the prow of the raft. I was intent. Just at the last moment, the raft came near, and the guide reached out and tossed me in, and we immediately swept over the rocks in the turbulence. All of my thoughts and desires were riveted on making it back to the safety of that raft. Imagine the good that would flood into our lives if we stayed riveted on Jesus Christ and His love, no matter what our circumstances. Jesus Christ says, look unto me in every thought. There's that mental effort again. And as we look, the Lord comes into focus in our mind and heart. Alma the Younger is keenly focused as he reaches for the Savior, explaining in these words, While I was harrowed up by the memory of my many sins, behold, I remembered also to have heard my father prophesy unto the people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, a Son of God, to atone for the sins of the world. Now as my mind caught hold on this thought, I cried within my heart, O oh, Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me. And now behold, when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. And oh, what joy! We invite power and faith into our lives by our wholehearted allegiance to Christ. And then, Despite our weaknesses, we will be pulled out of the river. We will be driven to the swimming pool, and we will be supported across the finish line. Even when needed, we will be given the right words to speak. For when we are focused and yoked to the Lord, He becomes the doer of our deeds. In Jacob 4, verse 6, we read of the many powerful things we can do by faith in Christ. Then in verse 7, we read, Quote, the Lord God showeth, showeth us our weakness, that we may know that it is by His grace that we have power to do these things. When David and I served a mission in Sao Paulo, Brazil, my Portuguese was limited at best. I, my testimony sounded something like, You nice, me happy, gospel true. <laughs> We gave many state conference talks, and I always had my same trusty dog-eared Portuguese talk ready to read. Then one Sunday, sitting on the stand at a state conference, preparing to step to the podium and read that talk, I was suddenly aware of a strong spiritual prompting. It went something like this. Leave your talk at your seat and speak from the heart. Oh dear, I became all trembly and twittery. My focus on the Lord sharpened considerably. I turned my hope, thoughts, and feelings over to Heavenly Father, pointedly pleading for help in the name of His Son. I wobbled to the podium, stared out at the conference, and opened my mouth. My verb endings were surely mangled, and no doubt my pronunciation hurt every ear but I was directly focused and concentrated on the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. I felt it and was able to share it. The Spirit used those broken Portuguese sentences to convey truth, and many hugs and tears came from members after the meeting. 
The Lord will take our earnest, though meager, offering, be it two small fish and a few small barley loaves, our weak Portuguese, or a sincere, though awkward, attempt to mend a relationship, and turn it into a nourishing spiritual meal if we come with focused purpose to Him for help. We really have no power to create good. All good comes from God. King Benjamin tells us to remember our own nothingness. Ammon says, I know that I am nothing. And Moses declares, now I know that man is nothing. Of course, we do have great value, but our mortality and fallenness render us powerless to change ourselves and progress in truth and happiness. We have great need of a Redeemer, and the Lord wants us to understand this and look to Him. And so, as we do our best, and even as we face disappointments that life brings to all of us, we still look to and act on our deep trust and obedience to Jesus Christ. And we are promised that we will prosper in the land. He is our hope. The French artist Eugene Bernard created a most poignant painting. In fact, we have a print of it hanging in our home, where it reminds us to look to the resurrected Lord. In this art, named Lively Hope, we see two apostles, Peter and John, running across the Jerusalem landscape at daybreak, ostensibly toward the tomb. Their faces peering hopefully, trustingly forward as their coats fly back and their hands clasped in front. Their entire being is pointed toward the resurrected Lord. May we take time each day to look to our one source of salvation and healing, power and goodness, our Savior Jesus Christ. And as we do, I testify that He will draw us close to Him, will give loving grace in our daily lives, and in time, bring us back to our heavenly parents. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.